Hi, I'm Nigel, and this is Nigel Goes to Space. Welcome to my home and to my kitchen. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the preparations I need to undertake before my big space trip. I thought it would be fun to make a list of some of the things that I need to do before going up to space, and I put them up on this whiteboard. The first thing was to buy the ticket. I put that at the top of my list. Buy ticket. I did that back in 2009. I've got that safely in my pocket, so we can tick that one off. Secondly, to fly into space, you have to be over 18. Well, I passed that one okay, no doubt about that. But there's no upper limit for going into space. The oldest person to fly into orbit was John Glenn, the American astronaut, who was 77 when he went up on the space shuttle. And some of my colleagues in Virgin Galactic who are flying with me are in their 70s and 80s uh, training to go up there. So a bit of time for me still to go up there before uh, it get too long, long in the tooth. Um, right, get fit. This is something that you have to do. I'm not going to tick that one just yet. <laughs> I've still got a bit of way to go before I'm really happy that I'm there. But you don't have to be absolutely super fit. You don't have to be Superman or Superwoman to go into space. As long as you're reasonably fit, you don't have any serious medical condition. And the doctors on the programme are working with you. No one's going to cross you off a list if you're not that unwell. What they want to do is to get you fit to go up there. So we're working as a team to be well enough to go. So that's some um, business in hand. When we're up in space, obviously we're weightless, we're floating around, that's the idea of the flight, that's one of the beauties of going into space, and we need to train for that. And that takes me on to the Vomit Comet. Now that's not as bad as it sounds, that's actually a plane which flies you in loops like that, so you're not in space, but as you go over the top of the loop, you get 30 seconds of floating about in what feels like weightlessness. Now I did that last year, so I can tick that one off the list and the other end of the spectrum is when you go up into space, you push back in your seat by obviously the power of the rocket and you feel three or four Gs, three or four gravities of force. So you're several times your normal weight. Uh, and we can train for that in the centrifuge. That's the device where you sit in a cabin and it whirls you around and around and around and you push back in your chair. Uh, so we can check out how we are going to cope with the uh, many G-forces pushing us in our seats. Um, I'm going to do that later this year, so I'll be telling you later on. Oops, uh, I've crossed that off too early, never mind. <laughs> we'll get to that later on in another program. And then we have the final training. And this is just before the flight. We spend three days at the spaceport in New Mexico where we fly from and we'll go up in the carrier plane which takes our little space plane up to 50,000 feet and we'll be in the space plane itself. We'll meet our colleagues, we'll do some team training together and that will be the final preparation before we actually take off. I'm only going to space for a few minutes so that'll be enough training for me but if I was a professional astronaut, a career astronaut going up to the space station for months or maybe a year, next year we've got two astronauts going up for a whole year in space then you need to be a lot more prepared than that. Uh, so a lot more fitness training, a lot more uh, bonding with your team. That's what you have to do. Um, also, if you're going to be going out to spacewalks, you have to be more used to traveling around, not just on the uh, vomit comet, but to maneuver yourself and your tools um, around the space station to do underwater training. So there's a huge water tank in Houston at the Manned Space Flight Center there, and you get in your spacesuit and you float around, and of course it's as if you're weightless because you're underwater. We have to get used to um, space food. Now I'm not going to be eating much or drinking much when I'm up there, but obviously when um, you're on the space station, you've got to uh, think about food. And there is quite a selection now. It's all, not all just the freeze dry stuff they had back in the old days. There's quite a selection there, but everything goes up dry. You have to have water, put it in the microwave, and the drinks. Because it's weightless, you can't just slurp a coffee. You have to have it in some kind of container and you suck it up through a straw. The space is really international. So if you go to the space station, people will be talking different languages. So the main languages are English and Russian. Now for my flight, I don't have to speak Russian, but that'd be quite a cool thing to do. So uh, I'll let you know how I get on with my Russian lessons. <laughs> um, also, well, the big question is, how do you wash? In space, it's weightless up there, water drops will just float around. And actually, how do you go to the toilet? Well, many people have spent 
many years trying to work out the best way to do that for the astronauts. So uh, we'll be talking about that in another programme. And what about leisure time? Astronaut fun. You can't work all the time up there. And in fact, there was one mission in the early days when the astronauts actually revolted because the ground control was telling them to work all the time. They had absolutely no time off. So what do you do if you're up there in space and you've got a bit of time on your hands and you want to relax? Well, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different ideas and different astronauts do it their own way. And I'll be looking at some of the ways in which space is not just a mission. It's not about science, but it's also about enjoying yourself. As I've already said, I'm going into space with Virgin Galactic. So what happens on the big day? We're out at Spaceport America in the desert of New Mexico. There's a purpose-built building there, the terminal building and the runway. We've had three days training and now the day dawns. Well, first of all, there's the astronaut breakfast. That's always a big deal. The Americans traditionally back in the days of the moonshots had a steak and eggs. Well. That's for not for me because I'm veggie and I rather prefer what the Russians do, which is have a celebratory glass of champagne. <laughs> then we're out on the runway, we climb aboard and there's no fighting over window seats. There are only six passengers on board, three on each side, and we all get a good view as we taxi down the runway to take off. To show me exactly what's going to happen on our mission, uh, Virgin Galactic have sent me this fantastic flight manual. Now look at this. Isn't that just about the biggest book you've ever seen? All the words on the outside and inside we've got the picture of the mission step by step. So here we take off uh, our mothership. The aeroplane takes us up to 14,000 metres, that's 50,000 feet. And then our rocket drops off, lights a rocket engine and whoosh! Up we go into space. We look down. We can see the mothership flying back down to Earth again while we have our several minutes up in space. And after the mission is over, that's about three hours in total, our spaceship comes back down again, glides gently down back to Earth, and we land back at the spaceport. That's all about my particular mission, but there's a lot more going on out there. Space travel, exploding stars, the Big Bang, everything in the universe, in fact. So I'll be telling you more about that, things you can see in the sky, and please send in your questions, because I'll be answering those too in future episodes of Nigel Goes to Space. And don't forget, subscribe to Naked Science.